Hello and welcome to Contract Law, Introduction and Offer Part 1. Uh, contract Law, it's an important topic in its own right due to the fact that it underpins many subjects on the LLB and also in practice. A uh, starting point is to explore the basic concept of what a contract is and then introduce the formation of a contract. Offer and acceptance together are called agreement but our starting point in introducing contract law is to focus on the principles of offer and invitation to treat. If we ask a lay person, a non-lawyer or a non-law student what a contract is, then that person would most likely say that it is an agreement between two or more people. This is not adequate though for our purposes. We need something more than this. As with all topics in law, we should go to the source material source material for the purposes of studying law are legislation, case law and or academics. When going to source for a definition of contract, we can do no better than referring to Professor Tritel. Uh, Professor Tritel, he says that a contract is an agreement that gives rise to obligations which are enforced and recognised by law. He says that the fact that it distinguishes contractual from other legal obligations, for example, in tort, are that they are based on the agreement of the contracting parties. We can also make reference to Sir Frederick Pollock, who says that a contract is a promise or a set of promises which the law will enforce. And Sir William Anson's, he has a uh, definition himself, which is that the law of contract may be provisionally described as that branch of the law which determines the circumstances in which a promise shall be legally binding on the person making it. It can be seen from these uh, three great minds of contract law that not all agreements will be an agreement that is enforceable in law. For example, a social arrangement or an illegal agreement or an agreement contrary to public policy. Such agreements will not be enforceable. It's the enforceability of the agreement that plays a role in determining what is a contract. The three essential elements of a valid contract under English law are agreement made up of offer and acceptance, intention to create legal relations and of course consideration. Here we will examine offer and acceptance. It is that meeting of the minds of the two parties, the consensus ad idem. The meeting of the offer with the corresponding acceptance constitutes the agreement. So we need to know what is an offer and need to be able to distinguish an offer from other forms of communication. A crucial distinction to be made is between offer and invitation to treat, because in order to have an agreement, we must have an offer that can be accepted and not just an invitation to treat. An offer could be defined as a proposal or a promise by one party who is called the offeror in law to enter into a contract on a particular set of terms with the specific intention of being bound to that promise as soon as the person to whom the promise is made, the offeree, signifies his acceptance where from an objective standpoint there is an expression of willingness by the offeror to be bound by its terms once it has been accepted by the offeree. So how can an offer be made? It can be made to an individual, it may be made to a group, it may be made to the general public. For example, a reward for information for finding and returning a dog. It may be written, it may be spoken or implied by conduct. What amounts to an offer can give rise to a difference of opinion. A series of communications may take place during a bargaining process between the offeror and the offeree as they move towards a final agreement. This may make it difficult to pinpoint exactly whether a specific statement was an offer or only part of continuing negotiations between the parties. When answering exam questions, you have to be mindful of this. One approach to determine if there was an offer is to examine if they were expected to bargain further, or whether the communication to that point showed a clear willingness to be bound if the other party agreed and consented. 
some of the case law for this uh, point conflicts, but the uh, clear willingness to be bound if the other party agreed and consented seems to be the key. We'll now look at the conflicting cases of Storer and Gibson. So looking at uh, Gibson and Storer and the conflicting cases, both of these concerned um, Manchester City Council's policy of selling off council houses to its tenants living in them. Manchester City Council was conservative and they had a policy to make homeowners of their council tenants. So those that have been renting their properties now had the right to purchase, part of a right to buy scheme. Mr Storer and Mr Gibson were two such tenants who wanted to buy their council house. The control of the council passed to the Labour Party and they took a different view regarding uh, selling off housing stock and decided to discontinue the sale of uh, council houses. So we need to consider here the council's communications to each of these two gentlemen and how these communications were viewed by the courts and the determination of the courts of the status of each communication in, with regard to whether it was an offer or not. Okay, so we now need to uh, consider the two situations in this case and whether they are distinct from an offer and amount to an invitation to treat. This then makes a difference as to whether they can be accepted as part of an agreement. In Stora, uh, it was Mr Stora who received a letter from the council representative and there it said that I understand that you wish to purchase your council house and so we enclose the agreement for sale. If you sign the agreement and return it to me, I will send you the agreement signed on behalf of the corporation. In exchange, we will ensure that you get the agreement. Mr Stora signed and returned the council standard form agreement for sale before control of the council changed hands and it changed from the uh, Conservatives to the Labour government. Uh, the council sought to argue that um, this did not amount to an offer but the court disagreed as um, this was owing to the fact of the firm tone of the letter to Mr Stora which they found indicated otherwise. So what the case Stora shows us is that if there is a clear willingness to be bound by the communication, then that will amount to an offer. Now, uh, <clears throat> this could have been different had the council's letter not been so clear, such as if the council had uh, written something along the lines of we uh, may be prepared to sell you your council house at X price. This is exactly what happened in the slightly conflicting case of Gibson. Um, unfortunately for Gibson, the communication he had received from Manchester City Council was not that far along the continuum as that received by Mr Storer. Therefore, although he received a sympathetic judgment from Denning uh, in the Court of Appeal decision, when it reached the House of Lords, the House of Lords in agreeing with Lord Lane in the Court of Appeal were of the opinion that the statement may be prepared to sell was far too imprecise to want a clear willingness to be bound and as such the communication was not an offer at all. And we also need to look at the types of communications which pass between parties who are engaged in contractual negotiations. What is the uh, status of the particular communication and what are the actions of the participants? Is the communication verbal or is it written? Um, did X call Y on the telephone? All of these uh, things need to be considered as the influence as to whether the communication was an offer or not. I always think of it as sort of a spatial awareness and time between communications and that type of thing. If, if a communication from one party to another is not sufficient to uh, amount to an offer, then it may qualify as an invitation to treat, which we've already defined. Uh, the primary difference, and this should be noted, is the intention on the part of the person initiating the communication. An invitation to treat is distinct in that all that it does is merely invite offers rather than indicate a willingness to be bound, which is what an offer does. It effectively sets up a scenario that allows the party inviting the offers to be able to accept or reject an offer that is made to him. 
So if a particular communication only reaches the level of an invitation to treat, then it will not have the binding effect in a similar fashion to an offer. Situations that um, amount to an invitation to treat include auctions, uh, advertisements, tenders, and displaying goods for sale. Uh, where And other examples would be uh, such as merely stating a price, which we shall look at in the next lecture. Um, so I um, hope you enjoyed this lecture. And if you did and you found it useful, then please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button as it really helps me out. You can also access uh, lecture notes to go with this lecture and others I've made um, on my website, which is www.uklawlectures.com. And there you can navigate to the notes menu where you can find free notes and also navigate to the books menu if you so wish where you can purchase books which I found useful in my studies and practice within the law. Thank you and goodbye.